Michael, welcome to studio. Thank you. Your latest piece of work, Decouching Theory, what made you come to embark on this piece of work? Well, it's really interesting. I think what we've seen over the last few years in a number of markets where sport is really an important part of the business economy space uh, is how broadcasters have done exceptionally well. So Supersport and ESPN and Fox and Sky in Australia and the UK have done exceptionally well in bringing awesome sport uh, to the viewer at home. The downside of that is that it's discouraged the viewer to get off the couch, get out of the lounge and actually go to the stadium. So, you know, increasingly we see this idea of decouching is what teams and, and sponsors and agencies have to do to increase the value proposition of getting people out of the couch, off the couch and into the stands. If we turn to the commercial side of it, um, if you've got this big brand that's advertising on TV and having people in their living rooms watching, um, it works really well for broadcasters because they can keep turning over the advertising. Sure, absolutely. I mean, the broadcast model, I think, has developed quite nicely. Uh, and it's both the sponsorship model of sponsoring content and sponsoring uh, both live and documentary or magazine-type shows within the media broadcasting space. But we've also seen the on-field technology, you know, develop quite rapidly. So the ability for broadcasters at different stages of the production feed to input uh, logos and to input sponsorships that you may not be on the field. So you could go to a stadium, uh, be it in Yayo Stadium in Nairobi uh, or Ellis Park here, and, and you can see something on the field that you won't see in the broadcast and the other way around. And so that's created massive commercial opportunities for broadcasters. Uh, you know, when you talk internationally and you look at Super Rugby, for example, the, the, the production of a game here at Loftus Fersfeld, for example, and broadcasting that in Australia, what you see commercially around the brand and the advertising might be different whether you're sitting in the stands or watching at home. If we go to your theory, how do we get the bums on the seats, as to say? It's the great challenge, and I think that's that's the, the, the challenge that's dominating uh, many sports teams in the U.S. and across Africa. It really comes to, to kind of two key areas. The one is we've got to enhance the upside of coming to the stadium, and we've got to decrease the downside of coming to the stadium. So broadcasters will continue to do what they do, and HD big screen TVs will continue to be an appeal in the couch, in the lounge. What teams need to work on is to make sure that some of the hygiene factors, what we call delivery variables, right, the aspect that make it a little bit tougher to go to the stadium, like traffic, um, like the weather, uh, like restrooms, uh, like queues uh, when, you, when you're trying to get your, your hot dog, which is overpriced, and your beer that's warm. And if you're trying to get those things in a stadium, that really reduces the value of being at the stadium, at the facility, whether your team is winning or losing. Because what we know from the theory and what we know from some of the research here in Africa as well as in, in Europe and the US is that people are going to these games not just to follow their team. They're going for an entertainment experience. They're going to socialize with a bunch of people. And so you have to look after those aspects and not just make sure that the team is winning on the field. Just take a step back. You mentioned the social aspect of it, that people go out as a form of entertainment. It's not just about going to watch the game, but it's a socialization. But is the reason why people are staying at home not that there's so many other competing social activities. So there's a difference between diehard fans and casual fans. The diehard fans that support their team, like Gorma here in Kenya or Kaiser Chiefs here in South Africa, those fans would come out every time and support their team whether they're winning or losing. Yeah, and there's that strong brand relationship, almost a love and a you know, strong relationship with their team. For those fans, they'll still come out and you can still put them in pretty hard seats uh, and give them warm beer, if beer at all, uh, and a very small hot dog. That kind of works. But, it, but the challenge is for many teams, the numbers of diehard fans is decreasing. And if they want to fill 30, 50, 70,000 seats, they've got to get casual fans. And the casual fans are coming for other things. But as you're right, the, the competing things in, in society, whether it's a jazz festival, whether it's you know, hot weather at the beach, that's going to be the, the distraction. Uh, and so I think increasingly what we see in work with people leading teams, people leading facilities and running sports businesses, is they're thinking of their competitors as any other lifestyle activity yeah, that is going to take discretionary spend away from sport. And that changes their strategy. It changes the way they think about what they have to do to get people to the stands. If we take a look and compare it, for example, to the cinema industry, which went through a very similar cycle um, as people's LSMs are increasing and their livelihoods better, and they're saying, we need to make it more comfortable. Exactly. Do sports teams, stadium managers and owners have the resources to be able to provide for the comfort factors? 
Often in the US, it's public resources, but absolutely, there's been massive upgrades in facilities. A lot of that is public taxpayer funds where they're uh, redoing parts of the stadium. They're putting in a lot more hospitality, a lot more suites, a lot more VIP and luxury seating in order to create a very much more customized, segmented approach, right? So in the same way that you go to your local cinema uh, and it might be a really basic seat uh, and it's the love seats at the back, or you go to certain cinemas and it's much more plush and you get a glass of wine, that's the kind of segmentation we're starting to see in the sports environment as well. So you've still got to have your 30 to 40,000 people screaming and going crazy because that makes a great stadium experience. It makes a great broadcast experience. You can have people sitting, um, have, sipping champagne uh, in the suites, in the boxes, but that doesn't make great TV. And so the broadcasters understand that you've got to have some crazy fans going wild in the stadium because that adds to the whole atmosphere. Are we also seeing a change in the format of how teams are managed? So there's a marketing team that's dedicated solely to bringing in more people to the stadium. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think what we've certainly seen in the U.S. for a number of decades now uh, is, is some strong skills, strong talent being brought into what's called the front office, right? The guys actually managing the business side of any sport. So not the technical team, not the coaches, not the guys involved in, in the actual team and action on the field, but really the business of the facility and, and the business of the brand. Uh, and, and so if you think about the Giants or the 49ers or the Warriors or any of those, those professional teams, for example, in the Bay Area in, on the West Coast, uh, you're typically seeing 30, 40, 50 people uh, being part of those organizations in the front office in a marketing, sales, customer experience kind of role across South Africa, across Botswana, Zimbabwe, Kenya, Nigeria, you'd probably be talking about less than a dozen in a similar kind of environment. Uh, but, it, but increasingly, I think there's a recognition with the right kind of resources being generated that we need to increase the number of people that, that are doing this in our teams. We need to increase the skill level. There's obviously been a massive shift towards more qualified people, people who don't just love the game, but love the business of the game. At the end of the day, nothing beats the authentic experience of being at a stadium when records are being broken, as we recently saw with the cricket. Absolutely. The excitement, uh, having you know, 30, 40, 50,000 people around you all celebrating that match winning, that world breaking record. I think there's nothing that beats it. And I think what we're seeing is it's kind of an oligopoly approach, right, where the best teams in the world continue to attract massive amounts of spectators uh, as well as broadcast viewers. The challenge is the next tier. The challenge is when you're not the top two or three teams uh, in, in a professional league or in a college league. Uh, and for the majority of sports businesses, that's the challenge. When they're not winning the cup, when they're not winning the championships, how do they get people to come out? And they're going to do a lot more than just perform on the field.